Dr. Harmon, how you doing? Can you hear me? Dr. Harmon, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. All right. Okay. Adele and Karina, how we doing? We still have, we still have one minute. We're doing well. Doing good. Are we, we're on Facebook, correct? Facebook feeds good? YouTube is good. And okay. now? <clears throat> All right, I'm checking the Facebook feed right now, the Facebook feed right now. Okay. Hi, Dr. Harmon. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Okay. You too. Okay. I'm going to start recording. Okay, I think we're good to go. We've got the, um, we're, we're good. All of our feeds are good. I'm going to start recording. Dr. Harmon, you're good? All set? I'm good. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to another Wednesday of theology here at the University of St. Thomas. We're continuing our first uh, annual Truth and Tradition Summer Theology Lecture Series. There's a mouthful. It's great to have you back. We've been really excited. I've gotten so much feedback these last, I think, nine. I think we're on, I think we're on talk nine. And uh, there, there's been such great feedback. We've had some great Q&A, some fantastic talks running the gamut. And of course, the theme is Truth in Tradition. Why? Because here at the University of St. Thomas, this is what we do. We do tradition, deep in tradition at the, in the theology department. We do the Eastern Fathers, Augustine. We do Bonaventure Aquinas, John Henry Newman, uh, Pope Benedict, on and on. We, we, go, we take students deep into the tradition, always in view of scripture and the magisterium. And we have a really special guest tonight. Let's, why don't we begin with a word of prayer. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. With thee. Blessed art yes. thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, tonight is a, I'm very pleased to, to welcome our next speaker, speaker Dr. Thomas Harmon. Dr. Harmon is an associate professor and Scanlon chair in theology at the University of St. Thomas, Houston. I'm delighted to call him a colleague. He teaches undergraduate theology, also in the MA program in theology and in the honors program. He is the co-editor with Roger Nutt of Wisdom and the Renewal of Catholic Theology, Essays in Honor of Matthew Lamb, and is at work finishing a book on the universal way of salvation in the thought of St. Augustine. He received his BA in philosophy from Gonzaga University and his MA and PhD in theology from Ave Maria University. He lives in Sugarland, Texas with his wife and five children. Dr. Harmon, it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thanks so much for, for making time during your summer. Thanks for having me, John. And um, thank you very much for everyone who's tuning in also. 
Fantastic. It's the floor is yours. So let me just say this, everyone, whether you're watching on YouTube, we have we always have viewers on all three platforms on YouTube, on Facebook and on Zoom. Please feel free if you're on Facebook, throw your questions in the chat. We have some dedicated assistants that are monitoring the chats and can we'll, we'll grab the, we'll pick up the questions and make sure we get them to Dr. Harmon if Tom, time allows. The same with YouTube. Feel free to throw your questions in the in the chat. And also on Zoom, you, you are privileged here because you have the chat feature right here on Zoom. So just throw your question in the chat. We don't respond to raised hands. <laughs> That's a little distracting in mid Zoom presentation, but just throw your throw your question in the in the chat, and you won't be able to see it. But we'll be we'll get it, and then at the end, we'll we'll you know see we'll see if we can have a discussion about this. So, Dr. Harmon, it's all yours. Thanks so much. Okay, yeah, thanks very much, John. And um, I guess I'll just sort of launch in. Um, my title tonight is "How Not to Find God: Clues from Saint Augustine." Um, if I were cheekier and cleverer, I would have entitled it um, "Looking." for God in all the wrong places, but I'm not clever and I'm not cheeky, so I didn't do that. Um, so uh, I, I want to just start with a, a brief note about um, what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, my uh, goal here is to give you a kind of introduction uh, or a way in to reading the confessions. Um, maybe, uh, maybe you've read it before and um, uh, could use a little bit of a nudge to, to reread it. Maybe you haven't read it before and need a little bit of exhortation to do so. Um, and along the way, maybe there will be a couple nuggets for people who have gone through the confessions uh, many times. So that's my hope at least. So, um, all right. So uh, in the first chapter of the first book of his confessions, St. Augustine famously prays, thou hast made us for thyself and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. Everyone who's read the confessions knows that it takes quite a while for Augustine's heart to have anything approaching rest in God. Along the way, he suffers many false starts and dead ends, creating a sort of photo negative guide for the spiritual life along the way, how not to look for God. Now, Augustine's not every man, like a character in a medieval mystery play. Uh, nevertheless, he strives to show his readers what might be useful in his own adventures and misadventures. And for the reader of the Confessions willing to do a little work transposing Augustine's experience to his or her own, there are virtually inexhaustible riches of wisdom. In my talk tonight, I'd like to do a little bit of spade work here. Um, part of the work we as readers have to do is to understand the principles of each of these wrong turns so that we can transpose Augustine's late Roman experiences into our own experience. Now, um, just because of the amount of time that we have this evening, um, I'm, I'm mostly going to be able to just give you suggestions and hints, um, clues, as I say in my title. Um, now, for instance, um, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about um, as far as transposing from Augustine's circumstance to ours. Um, there are no manichees around today, at least not by name. So one of the things we have to think about is what can we learn from Augustine's misadventures as a Manichaean that can help us. So we'll explore that and some other things together. All right, now, as he lays, as, as he, sorry, as he himself lays it out, both in words and in the structure of the confessions, there are three main obstacles in his way as he tries to find God. These obstacles are what the later tradition would come to call the triple concupiscence, derived from the first letter of John the concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life. Augustine interprets these architectonic sins as affecting the three parts of the soul, as he received them from classical philosophy, the appetites, the spiritedness, <clears throat> and the reason. The appetites concern the inclination for things necessary for our bodily nature, either individually or as a species, namely food, shelter, clothing for the individual, and sex for the perpetuation of the species. Spiritedness concerns the inclination towards self-assertion and the sometimes angry inclination to overcome hardship or obstacles. Reason concerns our desire to know, especially the highest things regarding our spiritual life and God, but also about lower things concerning our life together in society. The three concupiscences combine to lead Augustine in several wrong directions. Tonight, I want to describe three in particular. 
first, Augustine falls in with the Manichees, um, and we'll talk more about them in a moment. Second, he becomes a skeptic. And third, he turns to philosophy as the exercise of reason unaided by grace, um, which turns out to be uh, both the, the best that he can, that uh, the, the best in terms of helping him define God, and it also has a, an unexpected effect, though, that, uh, that actually brings him perhaps uh, to his furthest remove from God as well. Um, so we'll talk about that and why that happens. Okay. Um, so all, through, all of these wrong turns have some kernel of truth and goodness about them, especially his foray into philosophy. But they all make Augustine miserable without God. Uh, but the misery he experiences as a result of each helps to spur him on to seek for the true God. In fact, Augustine understands the misery he endures because of his wrong turns as the salutary presence of God's justice, punishing his waywardness and thereby providing hints that he's on the wrong path. So his punishments become a sort of spur to him to examine his life. How much, how much worse a position he would be in, Augustine thinks, if God simply let him be content in the midst of his errors with nothing to provoke him to question his sinful, unfulfilling way of life. So that's the first thing we can learn. Pain and suffering, Augustine teaches us, is a sign that something is wrong. Bodily pain indicates some bodily wound or defect. Mental and spiritual anguish indicates some mental or spiritual wound or defect. If you are suffering, something is wrong. Now, there can also be different types of suffering. If I've been lazy for a long time and all of a sudden try to go back to disciplined work, I will suffer. It's hard, frustrating, it hurts. Okay? But while the pain is a sign that something's wrong, namely, I've been lazy and I've picked up bad habits, it is also a sign that something is right. I'm working my way out of my vice. There is an analogy with athletics. Training is hard and frustrating. It hurts, but no pain, no gain. Something analogous can be said about the moral and spiritual life. So the first place Augustine finds God is in his suffering, as a, salut as a salutary corrective for his vices. The consequences of his own sin provide the spur that he needs. In fact, he describes it in multiple places as the presence of God's eternal law to him. Um, so we can say, spare the rod, spoil the doctor of the church. Right, now, the Confessions begins with a lyrical meditation on how to find God. Having told us that our hearts are re restless until they rest in God, the next step is to find God. But where and how? Is God in a place? Before he has a mature understanding of the Christian doctrine of God, Augustine does not know that God is a spirit, or even really what it would mean to be a spirit. And God has no body that dwells in a particular place. So even as a young man and a budding philosopher, he is not able to understand that there is such a thing as immaterial substance. If it exists, for the young Augustine, it is matter. To say something is immaterial is just another way to say it does not exist. Um, now, the funny thing is, Augustine doesn't think that he's a materialist at this point. Um, it's only in retrospect that he realizes that this is the case, as he, uh, as he reflects, for example, on the impact that the Manichaean's uh, cosmology and um, uh, bizarre metaphysics has on his own thinking. Um, but Augustine, so now, and this is something he comes back to many times. Um, Augustine's intellectual incapacity uh, to understand immaterial substance will have the gravest influence on his life going forward as we'll see a little bit at least. The incapacity to understand the reality of immaterial substance also has the potential to warp our own lives now, here in the 21st century. Uh, the, the, the struggle with materialism is obviously a struggle that continues today. Um, by the way, uh, just as a side note, I hope you've been able to tune into our previous lectures on the soul uh, the last two weeks given by two of my colleagues in, the, in UST's philosophy department. Um, if not, uh, I think they're available online. So I encourage you to go back and watch those. And, all right, now back to Augustine though. Um, obviously a very bright young man, Augustine is driven in his childhood mostly by simple bodily desires and in his adolescence by a desire for praise. He excels in rhetorical competitions and basks in the glow of the prizes he wins. Here is how he describes his adolescent self. He says, 
I collect myself out of that broken state in which my very being was torn asunder because I was turned away from thee, the one, and wasted myself upon many. Now here, Augustine is talking to us. Um, he's saying that God as the creator is the transcendent one who has made the many created things. When human beings sin, they turn themselves away from the one God toward the many created things. Um, this is also as much to say that they turn themselves away from their source of being and life and toward nothingness and death. Their attention then is divided spastically among many things, which produces a painfully divided will as they flit willy nilly here and there, um, especially since there's nothing to guide their attention, not authoritatively and with uh, any kind of definitive organizing principle. Um, and that leads to a disorganized, disordered, and miserable life. So imagine, if you will, the world as a kind of great undifferentiated Twitter feed. So the first lesson for how to find God is not among the many created things. Created things are good, but they are not the ultimate and infinite good that our wills desire. And they are not the infinite truth our minds seek. To try to make a created thing bear that weight is to abuse it and to set ourselves up for painful disappointment. Um, in this regard, think of all the many created things we might try to make bear the weight that only God can bear. Pleasures like entertainment, food, drugs, or sex. Spirited pursuits like playing or following sports or politics, even friends or a spouse. It's always a good reminder not to try to make your spouse and God. He or she cannot give you what you can only receive from God. Um, now, the correlate of this is that um, uh, uh, if, if you can't find God among the many created things, and it's also true that you can't turn to the one as first principle either, which would be which would be the way that he's going to explore um, in his foray into philosophy. So we'll we'll talk about that in a minute also. Okay, so of course that does set up a question, right? So um, if you can't find God among the many things, and you can't find God by turning to the one, then how do you find God? Okay, all right, so we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. Now, when Augustine's 18, he heads to the, the late Roman version of college, a rhetorical school in Carthage, which is sort of like law school. And the point is to te teach people the eloquence and forensic skills that they need in order to persuade people, uh, especially to win courts uh, to win cases in the law courts. Okay, there, through a happy accident of the school's curriculum, he is introduced to Cicero, the greatest Roman orator, and his writings. Augustine studies Cicero in order to learn his eloquence and his outstanding writing style. But along the way, he also starts to consider the substance of Cicero's writing. It turns out that in addition to being an excellent orator, Cicero is also a br brilliant and subtle philosopher in the tradition of Plato's Academy. Through Cicero's writing, Augustine is introduced to a new type of desire, a desire so rare he could never have been expected to have developed it on his own, the de desire for wisdom. Now, just to disambiguate, we are not talking about a passing curiosity or obsession with solving some particular problem or the drive to pick up some sort of know-how to do your job better or win friends and influence people. There's no one weird trick we're talking about. The passage in which Augustine describes the introduction of the desire for wisdom into his soul is worth reading in full. Here's what he says. Following the normal order of study, I had come to a book of one Cicero, whose tongue practically everyone admires, though not his heart. That particular book is called Hortensius and contains an exhortation to philosophy. Quite definitely, it changed the direction of my mind, altered my prayers to you, O Lord, and gave me a new purpose and ambition. Suddenly all the vanity I had hoped in, I saw as worthless. And with an incredible in intensity of desire, I longed after immortal wisdom. I had begun that journey upwards by which I was to return to you. So here, courtesy of the old pagan Roman philosopher, Augustine receives his reorientation back to God. That is important to remember. The truth is the truth, no matter where it's found. 
And sometimes we are not disposed to hear the truth from more pious sources, either because of our own defects or because those sources have become so familiar as to become invisible. The first thing I have to do with my freshman scripture students is to skew their vision a bit. I call it making the Bible weird again. Um, so they can read the Bible in a new light and therefore hopefully actually see the Bible instead of it being a sort of piece of forgotten furniture in the landscape of their humdrum world. Um, yet, even with this crucial first step taken, Augustine does not travel a smooth road even in the beginning. It's one thing to desire immortal wisdom and quite another to be able to seek for it, much less to find it. Augustine finds himself at that point unable to navigate various competing types of philosophy. It turns out that it is one thing to claim to love wisdom and an entirely different thing, in fact, to do so. Augustine then, as we are now, was confronted with many charlatans who claimed the name of philosopher, but were totally unsuited to actually guide people to wisdom. Since Augustine himself had a malformed will and at this point a crude mind, incapable of distinguishing immaterial and material, he was himself totally unsuited to tell which ones claiming the name of philosophy were truly her adherents and which ones were charlatans. In any case, Augustine had had a religious upbringing courtesy of his mother, St. Monica, and he was distressed that the name of Christ did not appear in Cicero. So he decided to try to turn to the Bible. Boy, was he disappointed. His ultimate judgment at the exalted age of 18 was this. When I read those scriptures, I did not feel in the least what I have just said. They seemed to me unworthy to be compared with the majesty of Cicero. My conceit was repelled by their simplicity, and I had not the mind to penetrate into their depths. They were indeed of a nature to grow in your little ones, but I could not bear to be a little one. I was only swollen with pride, but to myself, I seemed a very big man. So um, we might experience something similar today. As a matter of fact, I know for my students, they do experience this today. So compared to the spectacle of the latest entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the sophistication of the new atheists and their slick YouTube popularizers, etc., the, the Bible seems similarly drab and unimpressive to today's 18-year-olds. And so where does Augustine find himself? His mind was too crude for real philosophy. He needed the intellectual discipline and insights to rise from mere images to unchanging truths, but he didn't have that ability um, or discipline yet. Um, at the same time, um, his mind, um, while being too crude, um, it, his will was also too swollen with pride uh, to benefit from the scriptures. He needed humility to enter into the scriptures mode of discourse in order to find the soaring majesty of its teachings. So what did that leave for someone whose mind was crude and will was prideful, who nevertheless had been attached both to the names, but not the substance of Christ and of wisdom? The Manichees. Okay? In place of Augustine's desire for truth and wisdom, the Manichees offered him shadowy imaginings and fables. They promised certainty, but ended up talking a lot of nonsense. Okay? Manichaeanism, if you're not familiar with it, uh, in its barest form, teaches metaphysical dualism, that the world was made in a bifurcated way by two deities, one good, the other bad. The good one made the more spiritual parts of the world. The bad one made the more bodily parts of the world. There is a war between these deities and their domains, which human beings find themselves in the midst of. Now, naturally attracted to simplistic dualisms because they offer clarity and also because we're basically justice seeking beings. We want to know what is evil in order to fight it. And we want to know what is good in order to pursue it. But there's also a subtler reason why we find these sorts of dualisms so attractive because they ex excuse our own culpability for good or for evil. If it can be shown that evil is a substance that comes from a bad God, then whatever is in me of that bad substance is responsible for my wrongdoing. I can remove myself morally from my own bad actions, ascribing them to an alien agency. This desire for self exculpation is also what I think explains Augustine's otherwise baffling interest in astrology. For behind astrology 
is the perennially tempting doctrine that our actions are caused by some superior and irresistible force. Now, there are no Manichees walking around our city streets and probably not very many Americans really take astrology seriously other than as some kind of game. But there are much more sophisticated dualisms that temp tempt us. The ideology of scientism, which is at its core materialist with respect to ontology and deterministic with respect to ethics also holds up the same temptation. Why do I commit adultery? Because I am programmed through millennia of evolution to seek out as many sexual partners as possible, etc. The funny thing about us is that we pair our materialism and determinism with an almost frantic emphasis on freedom and choice. So perhaps we are not so much more advanced than Augustine, the late Roman law student. So it's interesting to see how Augustine extricated himself from Manichaeism, um, also from astrology, although that, that happened, um, that was, that was um, almost certainly the less serious problem. Um, regarding astrology, um, Augustine sort of admits that he was not um, probably more attached uh, to that than our own contemporaries who kind of glance at their daily horoscope in the newspaper. Um, so what, what gets him free of that is, is actually fairly simple. Um, he hears the story of two simultaneous births. Uh, one is the son of a wealthy man and the other is the son of a poor man. And despite the astrological influences being identical at their births, their lives per proceed very differently. Okay? So as you might imagine, right? both chance and choice intervene to prevent any strong control over our destinies from material forces. Okay? Now, on the other hand, um, disentangling himself from Manichaeanism took longer and more effort. Okay? But ultimately, um, it happened because of two factors. First, he was very disappointed in the Manichaean bishop sage Faustus, who he thought when he came um, to Hippo uh, would be able to answer some of his more nagging questions about the sex teaching. Uh, Faustus, however, however, was a disappointment when he arrived. Uh, he was very eloquent, I'm sorry, uh, not Hippo, to, to Carthage. Um, he was very eloquent, but he was not very learned. Um, Faustus himself ended up asking if he could come to the study sessions Augustine was holding on various topics. Um, while Faustus was in town. And so, the, um, uh, so, so Faustus in fact became Augustine's pupil in certain respects um, while he was around. So now, now pre presumably because he could not find a Manichaean capable of teaching him, he eventually later turns to studying the works of the founder of the sect, a man, uh, a man whose name was Manny. In the course of his studies, he comes across two different sorts of pronouncements by Manny. First, Manny declares that he himself speaks with the full authority of the Holy Spirit. This was apparently not a very nuanced pronouncement since it, Augustine takes Manny to be saying something like that he has full teaching authority in every area. Uh, but then Augustine discovers in what is presumably a separate work of Manny, an astronomical mistake. Manny has incorrectly predicted an eclipse. Well, that was the last straw for Augustine who says that he had he began to, to detach himself from the Manichaeans at that point. So because Manny immoderately claimed authority in all things, including matters of scientific investigation, all it took was one instance in which a pronouncement of Manny's could be empirically disproven to destroy the basis of all of Manny's authority. Now, Augustine was very grateful to the natural philosophers, or as we would now say, scientists, who helped him understand astronomy. They saved him from servitude to, to Manny's imaginary cosmology and fraudulent religious authority. Um, but as a mature writer, uh, uh, writing years after the event, he also enters a note of criticism for the natural philosophers too. While they genuinely knew things, knew true things about the creation, they neither acknowledged the creator as creator, nor did they give thanks and praise for the creation to God. For Augustine, the whole of the cosmos points beyond itself to its creator. It would be much better for these natural philosophers also to acknowledge God. In fact, he says that the unlearned old woman who gives thanks to the creator for his works is in a much better position than the scientist whose knowledge about creation extends so deeply, um, but never gets to the creator. Um, now, after Augustine's long dalliance with Manichaeism, um, he turns hard against faith of any sort. He describes his situation saying, um, here's, here's Augustine again. Um, I held back my heart from accepting anything, 
fearing that I might fall once more. Whereas in fact, the hanging in suspense was more deadly. I wanted to be as certain of things unseen as that seven and three makes 10. For I had not reached the point of madness which denies that even this can be known, but I wanted to know other things as clearly as this, either such material things as were not present to my senses or spiritual things which I did not know how to conceive save corporeally. By believing I might have been cured, for then the eye of my mind would have been clearer, and so in some way uh, have been directed towards your truth which abides forever and knows no de defect. Okay, so, so that's what he says there. So same as for us, uh, for Augustine, mathematics is the very model of a discipline that results in certainty. But as he would discover later, that is only because the certainty gained through mathematics is so easy, the evidence so clear. Just because certainty is not won as easily in other disciplines does not mean it is not available. But Augustine had been burned by believing too gullibly when he belonged to the Manichaean set. And it would take a while for him to recover. Um, but also Augustine doesn't let us put the blame where it doesn't deserve to go. The problem was not that belief or faith was bad. The problem was that Augustine believed when he should not have. But later on, this gives Augustine an, an opening to praise the Catholic faith. He describes Catholicism as opposed to Manichaeanism as acting, quote, more modestly and honestly, honestly in requiring things to be believed which could not be proved, whether they were in themselves provable, though not by this or that person, or were not provable at all, than the Manichaeans who derided credulity and made impossible promises of certain knowledge, and then called upon men to believe so many utterly fabulous and absurd things because they could not be demonstrated. Uh, so as compared with the Manichaeans, um, he says that Catholicism um, actually uh, requires um, very moderately um, of its adherence um, uh, regarding belief. Right, now, as part of their attempts to persuade Catholics to join them, the Manichaeans had developed a fairly extensive apologetic against the Old Testament, in which they claimed that the Old Testament creator God who created the material world was bad, and that Jesus came to free us from the dominion of the Old Testament God. After he leaves the Manichaeans, he becomes open to the possibility that they were wrong about the Old Testament. It's through listening to the sermons of St. Ambrose that Augustine realizes that the Old Testament can be read with the spiritual senses. This realization is a watershed moment for Augustine as it opens up new vistas for him. He realizes, maybe the first, for the first time, the internal coherence of the scriptures, perhaps one of the things that held him back from appreciating them when he tried to read them earlier, and learns about the providence of God, directing imperfect and sinful human beings toward their perfection, what the fathers of the church called the divine pedagogy. It also seems to have prepared him for the philosophic labors he was about to undertake by, by moderating the crudity of a mind circum, circumscribed by materialism. It pointed him to the fact that God is not merely present here and there, but is present in the whole order of creation as creator and also redeemer in a way that is not threatened by the presence of evil and sin. It prepared him to understand philosophically the transcendence of God, but it also prepared him um, uh, to, to realize the answer to that question I posed earlier, okay, if not among the many, and if not by directing yourself toward the one, where do you find God? Uh, well, it turns out that um, it's, it's the whole order of uh, creation that uh, points toward God. And so it's, um, and this is, this is um, uh, this, I, I got into this in my, in my, uh, my, my course um, on patristics, but um, the, the Confessions itself is structured to show us this. Um, so for the moment, you'll have to have to take my word for it if you haven't read it before. But uh, the whole structure points out that it's the whole order of creation um, that that points to God as as creator. Um, OK, uh, now um, the understanding of the transcendence of God was important for, for two reasons. First, it allowed Augustine to understand that God was not responsible for evil because it removes God from the crude, crude dualism of the Manichaeans. The human will is now a sufficient explanation for evil, avoiding the necessity of ascribing evil to some metaphysical principle or evil substance in the world determining evil actions. Okay. 
Um, also, second, it allowed Augustine to understand that to look for God, what was necessary was something different than what was necessary to look, look for any created thing. Up until this point, Augustine has had a very hard time thinking about God. He knows God is in some sense everywhere and not identical with his creation, but cannot parse how. He, embarrassingly, as he thinks later, tends to think of God as a kind of giant sponge, extended everywhere and containing everything else. But that leads to ridiculous conclusions. For instance, that larger things have more of God's presence than smaller things. An elephant would enjoy more of the presence of God than a man. This is all a result of his crude attempt to think of God as a material thing, or rather, of his inability to think of God as anything other than a material thing. Now, at this point, Augustine is introduced to the Libri Platonicorum, or the books of the Platonists. Uh, these are probably mostly books by the philosophers Plotinus and Porphyry, whom we now call Neoplatonists. From the beginning, um, as he's talking about these books, Augustine emphasizes both their sharp insights into the highest, the very highest things, um, and also their pride. Um, especially the effect they have on Augustine in inflaming his own pride. Okay, unlike the Manichees, the books of the Platonists both promise and deliver real wisdom. Unlike the scriptures, the books of the Platonists do not inculcate humility. The books of the Platonists take Augustine on a kind of ontological journey up the chain of being, from the objects of the senses, the senses themselves, then on to the objects of the intellect, and then to the mind itself. From there, Augustine is led to contemplate the very source of our mind's ability to make judgments, which is unchanging truth. That truth, he says, is not identical with the mind, but rather is above it. <clears throat> not spatially above, but rather ontologically above, since it provides the capacity by which we judge, as the light of the sun provides the means by which we can see. So let's see how he describes it. Um, he says, Thus by stages I passed from bodies to the soul with, which uses the body for its perceiving. And from this to the soul's inner power to which the body's senses present external things as indeed the beasts are able. And from there, I passed on to the reasoning power to which is referred for judgment with what is received from the body's senses. This too realized that it was mutable in me and rose to its own understanding. It withdrew my thought from its habitual way abstracting from the confused crowds of phantasms that it might find what light suffused it, when with utter certainty it cried aloud that the immutable was to be preferred to the mutable, and how it had come to know the immutable itself. For if it had not come to some knowledge of the immutable, it could not have known it as certainly preferable to the mutable. Thus, in the thrust of, an, of a trembling glance, my mind arrived at that which is. Right. Now, so through his philosophic tutelage under the books of the Platonists, he has the certainty he's been desiring about God. But he also narrates these findings in a deliberately odd way when he tells us what things he learned from those books of the Platonists. Instead of giving us quote, quotes from them, he actually uses the Gospel of John to present what he learned from the Platonists. Why? Well, to show that if he had been humble enough, he could have learned these same exalted things from the scriptures. But he also shows us the things that he did, he did not learn in the books of the Platonists that he could only learn from the scriptures, namely that God is humble and that he was humble enough to submit to the incarnation and so to share the station of his creature and therefore also calls on human beings to imitate his humility, especially in contrition and confession of sin. Uh, but the incarnation is a, is a historical event. <clears throat> um, uh, it, it can't be searched out using only the powerful capacities of his intellect. It must be believed on the testimony of another. Faith is both interpersonal and inherently humble. Uh, yet what was the effect of his newfound intellectual achievements at the tutelage of the, of the books of the Platonists? Well, um, to puff him up, to make him proud, therefore to separate himself further from others who do not share in his great philosophic achievement. After grasping unchanging truth and immaterial substance, Augustine finds himself seemingly both closest to 
and furthest from God that he's ever been. Um, his purified mind has been freed from his false imaginings about God, but his pride has separated him from the God who wants not only to be known, but also to be loved in communion with his church. And so he finds, as he describes it, uh, that he, quote, lacked the strength to hold my gaze fixed. My weakness was beaten back again so that I returned to my old habits, bearing with me but a memory of delight and a desire for something of which I had caught the fragrance, but which I had not yet the strength to eat. Um, so his intellectual achievements bring him close to God in one respect, through knowledge of what, what we might call natural theology. But his pride keeps him far distant from God. What does pride do? It separates. It makes Augustine want to be separate from the lowly, the little ones the gospel speaks about, those who don't share his exalted philosophic achievements. It makes Augustine identify himself excessively with his own mind to the exclusion of the humbler parts of himself. So here's the final way not to look for God, pridefully as someone trying to figure God out, to rest secure in one's own achievement. So uh, Augustine has brought us through three phases of looking for God in the wrong way. He could not find God among the fables and lies of fake religion. He could not find God by assenting only to things he could be as sure about as he is about mathematics. And he's, he could not find God through the mon monumental individual intellectual effort of philosophic speculation and contemplation. Okay, so how does Augustine eventually find God? Well, I'll give a little preview, but, um, but you should really read the confessions if you haven't already. So, so, so first, um, it's really God who finds Augustine rather than Augustine who finds God. Augustine needs to learn to let himself be found okay, through the confession of his sins. He brings himself to the light and stops hiding himself. Okay, so by confessing our sins, that the sins are what, what um, uh, create a cloak of darkness around us. It's what Adam does when, uh, when he commits the original sin. He hides himself, right? Um, so uh, in order to be found by God, um, the, the, the first step is to confess sins. Um, so the, the, and second... Um, what he finds is that it is Christ, the mediator, who gives him the strength to cleave to God that he could not find in his philosophic studies. Uh, third, it is in the communion of the church through her sacraments, together with his fellow believers, that Christ, the mediator, is able to touch him. Okay, okay now, I hope I've whetted your appetites to read or reread the confessions again. Um, and at this point, I think... Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking a little bit and um, I'll let you guys ask some questions. So, Dr. Kerwin, if you want to jump in here. Dr. Harmon, thanks so much for a fantastic lecture. That was really, really interesting. Um, okay, Jim C., you got a hand up. Can you throw, your, can you throw your, your, your question in the chat box? That would be great. Um, and also those of you on YouTube, I know we have, uh, there's a, uh, the Holy Rosary young adult, uh, young adult group is actually listening. They're having, we had a couple watch parties going on around, around town. So feel free to throw questions in or things you've been discussing as you've been watching. First of all, Dr. Harmon, how, what would you recommend reading to learn more about Augustine? If somebody wanted to try to get a grasp on the confessions and his thought and life on their own. That's a good question. Um, you know, there's not a lot out there that I actually like a whole lot. Um, uh, there's a there's a book by Matthew Levering um, uh, that goes through his theology. That's pretty good. Um, uh, that that it, that's appropriate for someone who has a, a some kind of grounding in theology first. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, th there's a there's a biography by Peter Brown um, that's okay. Um, it's pretty good. Um, I, I don't think it gets too deeply into the substance of his thought very well, but uh, it's, it's good on things like the sort of external facts of his, his biography and history. Um, other than that, uh, there, are, um, uh, there are some more sort of scholarly things that I, I would recommend. Um, for, um, for, this, for, for the confessions, um, it wouldn't hurt. This is the version that I usually use. It's the Hackett edition, which is very cheap. Um, and um, it's got um, 
uh, notes by um, an excellent scholar of St. Augustine named um, Michael Foley. So going through the confessions with this edition with the notes um, is actually a great way to start. Um, there's also another, there's another companion volume to the confessions called um, Augustine's Confessions, A Reader's Guide. And that's got some really terrific essays in there, especially by uh, John Cavadini and uh, Frederick Crossan. Um, okay. So anyway, that's, that's what I would say about starting. But of course, you can also enroll in the MA program at, uh, at USD. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, this is actually, uh, I think this is actually, this next question is, is pretty broad and it's, it's, it's slightly off topic, but I actually think it's a really good question considering that these are popular lectures. This is a question that I think a lot of people would have if they're just kind of cutting their teeth in theology. So I'm gonna just kind of wing this out and let you have at it as you will, okay? Um, um, are there any major conflicts between the writings of St. Augustine and those of St. Thomas? And, and maybe, obviously, you know, kind of people are, are, a lot of people just kind of getting into the, the Catholic tradition. What's the difference? What is an Augustinian? What's a Thomist? Huge question, but, you know, you, you can kind of have at it however you want. I think it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that's it's such a big and controverted question that I, I barely know how to start, actually. Um, uh, so, yes, I, I consider myself an Augustinian and a Thomistic ally. So um, uh, I, I certainly appreciate both. I've published on both. Um, one of the, I mean, it, it gets into the... Uh, I think there's a difference between um, the fact and the matter, like what St. Augustine teaches and what Thomas Aquinas teaches and the direction that many of their followers have taken things. Um, uh, anybody who's studied any thinker for any amount of time knows that these schools of thought develop um, based on the teachings of the master and then they fragment and um, they squabble amongst themselves. And um, sometimes these schools um, really are, are inadequately faithful to the master. Uh, they take parts of the teaching of the master and sort of um, hyper-focus on them and neglect other parts and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to say too much about either Augustinians or Thomas as a whole. Um, what I would say is that obviously the historical circumstances of each uh, were very different. Um, Augustine is obviously writing at the um, end of the Roman Empire and St. Thomas Aquinas is writing at, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Middle Ages um, in Christendom. So the political situation is quite different, um, which I think um, uh, uh, makes for a good deal of um, the difference in their thought as well. Um, so Augustine's uh, political thought is, I think, actually uh, quite a bit more developed than Thomas Aquinas's. Um, and, um, but, but, but the other thing is that their, their kind of philosophic interests and influences are, are somewhat different as well. Um, uh, Augustine is very much uh, within what we might call the broadly platonic tradition and Thomas Aquinas um, is, I mean, again, speaking very, very broadly is more influenced by, by Aristotle. And so one of the things that you find is that um, um, uh, in Augustine, there is not quite as much of a, a well-developed um, philosophy of nature as you find in Thomas Aquinas. Um, and so and that, that, that well-developed philosophy of nature ends up being very useful. Um, now, uh, I happen to think that there's a lot of things that Thomas Aquinas says that uh, on the basis of his knowledge and study of Aristotle that are, are quite not only compatible, but maybe even sort of like uh, refinements of what Augustine um, says. So I'm, I'm generally speaking, um, uh, I, I think that a lot of the differences between Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine as they've come out um, in sort of squabbles among schools are fake. Um, but there, uh, why did I choose? So I chose, I chose to study St. Augustine rather than St. Thomas Aquinas because I had, this, I had this intuition in grad school that maybe our times are more like Augustine's times than like Thomas Aquinas's times. Um, I think that's still basically true. Obviously, there are things we need to know from St. Thomas Aquinas also. Um, uh, but, but I do think that um, our civilizational and political circumstance is maybe a little bit closer to um, uh, an era ending as it was with the Roman Empire than in the middle of um, Christendom. So anyway, uh, uh, 
uh, it's, it's such a big topic. Um, um, uh, I could, I could probably talk for a lot longer than that even, but, um, uh, let me, let me defer to the next question. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Okay. Uh, this is a, this is a good question. Um, which one of the three wrong ways of finding God is more common nowadays and what should we do to remedy it? More common. Well, um, it's almost never very common to find, um, uh, to find yourself in, uh, involved in, um, uh, real forays into real philosophy. So that's definitely going to be the least common, <laughs> especially in America. Um, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'd say it's probably something of a tie between, uh, I mean, most people, most people insofar as they are intellectuals probably go in for skepticism more. Um, but probably the majority of people, um, if we're talking about the general populace, um, is sort of a, an unthinking dualist. Um, so it, that they're prob- um, I mean, this is actually something that, um, I mean, it, it's in a modern key though, right? Um, our dualism is shaped by the um, long trajectory of modern philosophy. Um, uh, I think Tocqueville remarked uh, at, at some point that, um, um, uh, now I, that, that I think that um, uh, uh, Americans uh, were sort of unconscious um, students of Descartes. Um, so we are sort of unconscious students of Descartes. Um, we've, we're sort of Cartesian without ever having read him. And Descartes, of course, is probably most famous for um, his sort of mind-body dualism, uh, which is not quite the same as the Manichaeans, um, but does end up having um, some similar effects um, as things play out. So uh, I'd, I'd say, so generally speaking, um, dualism um, is, uh, and th- th- that, that, by the way, ends up affecting um, uh, our, our kind of understanding of, uh, of, of Christian theology as well. Um, uh, I think it's still the case that the resurrection of the body is a very difficult thing for people to understand who are uh, under the influence of dualism. Um, but yeah, once you got, start getting into more educated circles, I think um, w- I think we almost have like a civilizational case of um, PTSD. Um, so what Augustine went through um, uh, individually, where he sort of like incontinently um, believed in these Manichaean fables, I think uh, Western civilization, at least in its more educated uh, uh, components, um, has this sense that maybe we... Uh, uh, we got burned by believing in Christianity. Uh, and so we're just not going to believe in anything anymore. So anyway, there you go. Okay. I, we're going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one, one more. Uh, your, a couple of your colleagues have weighed in with, with questions. So before we, we get to those and you can put your seatbelt on, I'm going to give you another one, another uh, softball. Okay. But I think it's a good one though. Um, it, it, you, you mentioned it, early on in the talk that you stress to your students the need to make the Bible weird. How do we do (laughs) this? How do we do this to our children, to our family members, to our fellow (laughs) Catholics to get them to see the Bible in the new light, in a new light? Yeah. I I like how you say that. How do we do it to them? Right. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I like that. Um, Yeah. uh, So look, I, there's a kind of popular version of Christianity that sort of domesticated Christianity. And um, uh, I, I think honestly, just sort of sh- focusing on some of the shocking elements in the Bible is, is important. Um, not only like, you know, there's always like, oh, 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 the Old Testament has dirty parts, right? Well, that's not quite what I'm talking about. But um I, I think that going back to the beginning and um, like uncovering why it was that the people to whom the message of revelation originally were shocked, I think that's the way to do it is um, uh, uh, once you start talking about, um, uh, I mean, just, just talking about the new Testament, right. The, the incarnation is wild and we have, you know, millennia of celebrating Christmas to make it seem less wild than it actually is. Um, but the idea of God becoming man um, is completely shocking and unexpected, actually. And 
Um, and actually, so someone like Chesterton is really good at pointing out how crazy this is um, and how you kind of really have to sort of like uh, turn upside down to turn right side up in order to see that properly. Um, but um, uh, but let me, just as a, as, a, as a very brief example of what I do is um, uh, everybody's heard about the creation story in Genesis. Okay? Everybody knows that there's um, six days and that God rested on the seventh day. And the kind of um, uh, a very freshman version of, uh, of discovering Genesis is asking, well, um, how could it be that these could be, um, that, that God could, could create the world in just six days, okay? And what I like to do is to point out that in this agricultural society, um, the idea that uh, Genesis would have the, the creation of the sun on the fourth day, but plants uh, um, on, on the third day uh, probably wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense to the people to whom it was addressed. And so there's already a clue in the text that this chronology is not meant or the, the sequence of the six days is not meant to be a just ordinary, straightforward chronology. And so all of a sudden you see that, that the Bible itself in that first story is trying to, to sort of skew your vision, to make you think in a way that's new, um, that's not um, uh, as, you're, as you're sort of habitually used to thinking. Um, all of a sudden we're required to hear the word day and to think of something other than a 24 hour period. Um, and so the Bible sort of wants to do this to you all the time, that the way that you perceive things ought not to be determinative for um, your understanding of how things actually are. Because frankly, uh, the way that we perceive things is, um, is, is, is wrong a lot of the time. So there you go. Okay. All right. Um, given his rejection of astrology, what would Augustine think of a cosmological argument for God's existence? Mm -hmm. hmm. given his rejection of astrology. I'm actually struggling to see what the, the link is between his re rejection of, of uh, astrology and a cosmological argument. Well, what, what, yeah, you, you mentioned his astrology that, that he was in he, that he was interested in that. I, I, maybe maybe the, the the question it's a bit vague, but maybe he's kind of getting at this this understanding he has of the natural world and you know causation or or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, uh, I mean, would there be a strong argument? I don't know. I I don't think that that Augustine would have. In fact, he didn't historically present some kind of proof um, like, uh, like you find, for example, in the Summa. Um, but um, one of the texts that he goes back to over and over and over again is Romans chapter one, um, which, uh, uh, you know, from, from, from the beginning of time, um, all the creation uh, attests to the existence of the creator, right? So um, he seems to, to, to think that, um, uh, if we weren't blinded by sin, um, then uh, the whole creation, um, the whole order of the creation um, would point to the creator. Um, and so it, it, it's a sort of sign that our imagination and our intellect is being cleansed and purified and put in its right order that we can start to see um, how sort of translucent uh, the whole order of creation is uh, um, with respect to the creator. Great. Great. Um, can you elaborate on what you mean by Augustine's political thought is more developed than, than Aquinas's? Yeah. So, um, uh, so Augustine deals with, um, sort of concrete political realities in a way that, that Thomas Aquinas, um, seldom does. Um, and the city of God is, you know, maybe is one of the greatest works of, um, uh, touching on political thought, um, that we have. Um, so, uh, St. Thomas, uh, has, um, he, he commented on the politics of Aristotle, at least the first couple books, he's got a teaching on natural law, which is not quite, um, political thought yet, although it has relevance for it. Um, and, um, he's also got this, uh, uh letter he wrote to this, the, the King of Cy Cyprus on, on kingship, which is probably his most sort of, um, directly political work. 
Um, but uh, but so 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 Augustine is aware uh, and engaged in um, the question of the the, the limits of politics. Um, um, he knows about the cycle of regimes and is interested in um, sort of cashing that out a bit. Um, and um, I think he um, he in a, in a much more sort of um, uh, robust way um, uh, is interested in pointing out to his readers how um, how politics affects them, how it shapes their soul. Um, and as a matter of fact, like the book book one of uh, on free choice of the will is really about how um, the the laws of Rome have shaped the soul of this young interlocutor that he has in the dialogue. Um, and so Christianity comes to light as um, sort of uh, having to deal with um, these, these uh, um, you know, either members of, um, of Christianity or potential members of the church um, who have already been shaped by the political regime that they've been in. And Augustine takes that very, very seriously. Um, I, I can't say that, that Aquinas doesn't take that very seriously, but he doesn't write about it as much um, uh, as, as Augustine does. So. Okay, uh, I'm going to, do you have time for one more? Sure. Okay, let's, uh, on, on that note, I think it's a, this is a kind of a fitting closing question. Dr. Harmon, I have, and, and given, given that we've just dealt with politics here, Dr. Harmon, I've tried to read The City of God but it's intimidating. What's the best approach that you recommend to try to get through it and to get the most out of it? Yeah, slow and steady wins the race, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the, the problem even there is that like the, the each you know the books of the city, there are twenty two books of the City of God and each of them are long, so you're you're going to have between fifty and one hundred and ten pages per book. Um, so it can it can be a real slog. I I would say that. Um, uh, if you're having trouble just getting through it on its own, um, I would try to pick up um, uh, maybe a good a good essay or two on Augustine's politics or on the city of God um, that can kind of give you an entryway into what to look for. Um, I always find that that helps when I'm I'm approaching something that's sort of big and intimidating and overwhelming is to have something in particular that I'm interested in following as a thread through the work. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, there's, there's a wonderful essay um, by Ernest Fortin um, in uh, a book called The History of Political Thought edited by uh, Leo Strauss and Joseph Cropsey um, just on Augustine. Um, and uh, if you start with that, uh, and that's like a 20 page essay, um, that gives you a, a, a kind of grounding and orientation to begin studying the work as a whole. And that might, might help uh, to give you a foothold um, in order to get through um, some of the book. And once you've gotten through, or once you start getting through some of the book, you've got, the, you've got some kind of orientation in the first book, for instance, that will allow you to get through um, subsequent books much better. So that would be my advice. You know what? That, that's a great uh, that's a great point. I actually have I have a PDF of that, so I can throw that in the thread because um, I, I think that's uh, Dr. Harmon just to underscore that it's a fantastic intro. And also, you, you mentioned uh, Matthew Levering's book. I mean, he has an interesting approach there, right? Because he just takes five of the is, doesn't he take five of the less read of kind of the classic works and just kind of go through in in summary fashion. I mean, I, I think that's what he does. He, and, and it's a it's a really good intro because you just kind of get these, you know, these overviews of some of his more important works. Yeah, I've got it on my bookshelf somewhere. I can't find it immediately. But anyway, but yeah, that, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, Dr. Harmon, thanks a million. That was a lot of fun. Really, really a lot of fun. I really appreciate you Great. coming in. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, everyone, for showing up. I appreciate you all being here also. And um uh, be sure you turn it, tune in next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Exactly. We have, uh, so we are actually, Dr. Harmon, you are number nine out of 13 and uh, we're heading in now we're heading into middle of July. So next week is going to be great. You have sister Chow Nguyen, uh, a Dominican sister. So the next four weeks, we have four more weeks. We have two Dominican sisters. We have a deacon in training, Dr. Hayes, and we are finishing it off with a father of 10, Dr. Aquila. 
on Newman and the development of doctrine. So we've got quite a we've got a uh, quite a, a a sampling. We've got the Virgin. Next week is the Virgin Mary in the Nexus Mysteriorum Fidei. I'm not going to tell you what that means. If you're really eager, you could Google it. Otherwise, you need to you need to show show up next Wednesday to find out what the Nexus Mysteriorum Fidei means. <clears throat> After that, we have Saint Ephraim, and if you if you know Dr. Hayes, you know you're, it's only a matter of of time before you get um, both barrels of Saint Ephraim, and that's going to be fantastic. Sister Albert Marie is going to be on Albert the Great and Eucharistic Beauty, and then we're going to finish it off, as I've said numerous times, with a, a fantastic unplanned. Uh, did you know you know who's you know what uh, Dr. Aquila is is finishing off on, uh, Tom? Newman, right? Yeah, and the development of doctrine. So we started with uh, with the with the cardinals talk on Irenaeus, the first theologian. I think he even subtitled it the first theologian. No, he he subtitled it the pastor of recapitulation. And we're finishing up with you know Newman's grand sweep in this this huge vista. So um, here is uh, we've got um, I've got the uh, the next week's uh, slide. They're queued up, and we're we're going to. Uh, uh, so next week, uh, please, if, if you're interested in, as, as Dr. Harmon said, there, if you're interested in going deep in the tradition, there is just simply no substitute for trained and faithful guides. And that's what we have in spades here at in the theology department at the University of St. Thomas. So give us a shout out. You can reach us on Facebook or you can shoot us an email, realtheologyust.com. Uh, you can give us a call and we'll, we'd be delighted to, to talk the program over with you. But Dr. Harmon, again, it's been a pleasure. Have a wonderful summer. And uh, I will see you. All right. Thanks, John. You got it. Thanks so much. We'll see you, Tom.